not enough staff, not enough staff. However, the goal here is to give you some strategies to be able to move forward in doing projects for your entity. So I thank you again for coming. First of all, we're gonna go over some of the basics, which are facts and figures. Uh, we're gonna talk about outcomes and objectives and deal with the resources uh, that's needed when you're doing projects, communication, also uh, agreed upon outcomes, how to deal with functional teams and the three Ps overall. Any successful project or endeavor, regardless, has these three things at the core. It has purpose, it has a process, and it has people. So regardless of whether it's at home or not, these are strategies you can use anywhere. And thank you so much. Also, I wanna let you know that this is one in several series that I'll be doing. There'll be another series in December, on December the 8th, and that will be st managing stakeholder and their expectations. And the other one in January will be procure to pay, where we'll be talking about the procure to pay process overall and how to do software projects. Because I know a lot of times that's being driven by teams outside of our control, but we also play a great role in that. So please consider joining me for the other two uh, uh, webinars. And I thank you NIGP for hosting me. All right, so let's move through the facts and figures. So introduction, what I wanna talk about a little bit is the success of capital improvement projects and capital expense. We know that the success of any project lies with the appropriate project delivery model. And sometimes procurement team professionals are not always given the ability to insert themselves into that process. But I say that it's certainly a time that we use all the skills that we have been given over the years to be able to make a difference to our organizations. So one of the primary reasons for using design build for example, in construction has to do with the delivery model taking less time and costing more. Sometimes that's not always the case, and we'll talk about that in a little bit in the future. So regardless of the project, clearly defined processes, clearly defined roles, clearly defined communications are key metrics to be able to use. And then we'll review how all of those elements are tied together. I thank you so much again for choosing this session. More than procurement. If anything that we've learned over the last couple of years as a result of COVID is that we are not just in procurement, we are part of a global supply chain. And now that we see what happens in China, Europe and all over the world impacts what we receive. What we've also learned is that how many American firms are dependent for uh, their uh, materials to be able to manufacture their products and goods and services from places we have never even heard of before. But that impacts procurement. And I think we saw disruptors in ways that we've never seen before. It also causes us to think about how can we be able to be the stars of our entities by having everything that's needed when there is a crisis. Again, we probably know now from the pandemic and from COVID-19 overall to not wait until there's an actual emergency before we have relationships and processes in place. And we'll cover a little bit of that in our session a little bit later. I want you to look at supply chain post COVID and look at the inventory increases. The Institute for Supply Management did a great job of tracking and keeping good statistics as to what occurred in a disrupting process, but also what occurred uh, post uh, COVID-19 and how the inventories uh, rose and how people started buying capacity. And these are things that we don't talk about in government procurement because they don't, we don't think that they're necessary. But buying capacity could mean a lot of things. One of the things that we talked about recently is that you could be buying capacity for paper goods 
in the warehouse from a paper company. Not that it's sitting on your doorstep, but you have it available to you if there is a crisis or if something does occur. Facts and figures. We're gonna talk about project facts. We're gonna talk about why a swap analysis is helpful and proactive versus reactive and the total cost of ownership and how we're going to manage risk. These are things that we're going to start bringing to the table to help our departments and our entities do a better job on their projects. And we are going to become, as our procurement team should, the go-to people, the go-to professionals that helps our entity to achieve their goals. Remember, our sole purpose for existence team is to help departments to be successful. We have to know what they need. We have to know what's funded. We have to know a lot of different things in order to be able to do that. Let's start with the project facts. I know some of you are smiling when you see the Clint Eastwood style and wondering well, what exactly could the Clint Eastwood style be? Well, if you think about the personality of Clint Eastwood, and you're probably thinking he has nothing to do with supply chain, but you'll be surprised. He actually owns a restaurant, or at least he used to, own a restaurant in Carmel, California called Hog's Breath. And uh, so he had to do some supply chain work to run his restaurant. But the primary reason why we're using the Clint Eastwood style has to do with this. Clint Eastwood in most of his movies, and it's particularly this one, the good, the bad, and the ugly. That is the project fact style. Because if we don't have all the facts, be it good, bad, or ugly, then we are operating with a limited piece of knowledge. And although we need to know everything, we don't need to act upon everything. And one of the reasons why this is important, what's good about the project that we're doing? Who does it help? And what's bad about it? Because not every project is completely positive. There are projects that are done for humanitarian reasons, for the benefit of our citizens, political reasons, uh, and sometimes from the pressure that we receive from outside to do things that has nothing to do with our core values or what we put down for our 2020 plan in terms of a 2030 plan in terms of what we hope to achieve for our entities overall. Also, embrace your critics. I know this is an odd thing to say, but they will tell you the truth. So since they're going to tell you the truth, use that truth to your advantage and take what they say and take the facts of what they say, remove the emotion and take the facts of what they say so that you can understand how that's gonna impact your department, how it's gonna impact the procurement process. Because one of the things I think that has been sort of something that's been disappointing to me over the years is the narrative about procurement. We've let everyone else say who we are instead of us telling them who we are, what we do, why we do it, how we do it. So I certainly encourage you to take a more proactive stance, definitely in that area, in terms of that. We're gonna look at a SWOT analysis, again, proactive versus reactive and the total cost. Starting with the SWOT analysis, this is a very, very simple tool. I've used this tool most of my career and it has been very helpful to me. Think about it, what is the strengths that your organization have? When I mean by strengths, what is it that you have that's at your disposal? What do you do well? We have a city where the citizens are very supportive. We have a harmonious uh, commission. We have a great relationship with our executives. What is it exactly that's your strength? And what will you use for that strength for this particular project? And the reason being, we have to consider the basics. Do we have an environment of get it done kind of people? And in some cases you don't. Oh, but it doesn't mean you can't get it done. So bear that in mind as well. What about the environment? 
Do we have budget shortfalls or do we lack the staff resources? What are our strengths or is that our strength? Because sometimes what we consider as weaknesses can often be strengths, but a point of caution. In leadership and in projects, you overuse of your strength can become a weakness. So be cognizant of that. When you're looking at your weaknesses, what are your vulnerabilities? Do you have a public that are afraid their taxes will be raised if you do projects? Are they uh, not engaged or apathetic? What are some of the potential pitfalls? We don't have a strong project management team. We don't have a strong engineering team. We don't have all the people or processes in place. But again, remember, there's nothing that you can't overcome. So what about opportunities? What is it that we can accomplish while we're starting this particular project? Because I always say, look at what you're doing today, but also what you can do tomorrow and the day after and the day after. Is there growth opportunities here? Can we grow or expand our reach in terms of our supplier pool? Can we increase our automation? Can we trim down or green our process or lean our process as well? And can we enhance something? There's always an opportunity to get the most out of a project in that regard. What about threats? What can interfere with the success of your project? Is it the fact that you don't have the right team cohesion? You don't have the right team put together? You don't have the right uh, support? Because it's extremely important to have support on several levels. And we'll talk a little bit about that later in the presentation. Also, what are the internal and external factors? Do you live in an area where you have to be cognizant of when you do construction or when you do projects because of extreme weather. We here in Florida, you know, we have a little wind and a little rain from time to time, uh, better known to most people in parts of the country as a hurricane. <laughs> but what threats can we accept? You see, we don't have to mitigate everything. We just have to know about it and have a plan for it if we need to and review the risks that affects the project success. Do we have weak contractors in our community? Do we have a, a lack of cohesion with the vending, the vending community? Do we lack perhaps even the expertise of what we're being asked to do? Even if that's the case, you can shore yourself up long before the project comes. What about proactive versus reactive? I'm really big into being proactive. I really am, almost to a fault. My family tells me you can't negotiate everything. To that I disagree, but I understand what they mean when you're in the family setting uh, at Thanksgiving. So let's talk about project planning. We need to ensure the objectives of the project are obtainable. I have seen many times where we would go forth and start a project knowing we don't have what it takes to really get it done, but because the, uh, the uh, executive told us we got to get this done, we just plow ahead knowing, knowing it will not be entirely successful. And I know as procurement professionals, that is not our heart and that is not our way. So one of the ways we can combat that is looking at the knowns and the possible unknowns, but do not use your experience or the experience of project managers and some engineers. And why would I say that? I say that because if you had an engineer who started a project and that was very new and didn't really understand your process, didn't really understand how to do everything and their experience, they come to the table as a team member saying, well, that project wouldn't work. And I can tell you about this time when I tried to do this and we tried to do this and it utterly failed. It failed, it failed. That is not the experience you want. And you have to, as procurement professionals, sort of put a dent in that and say, you know what, we understand, but our goal here today 
is to create a successful project. Our goal here today is to make sure that we get it right. Our goal here today is to get her done, so to speak. So plan your timelines and people and resources. And I say that because a lot of times you will create a core team. We create a core team and then we call that team to every meeting. You'll understand why that is not the most successful approach. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in the presentation when we talk about how to use the functional team approach. But these are all the things that you would have to do in advance to help the team get moving. What about truth to power? We have to share the facts diplomatically. Don't get me wrong, I know it's tough. I know it can be tough, but tell the execs and team members with as much grace and mercy as you can muster up. You, you have to let them know what the pitfalls are and be cognizant of who you're speaking to. Some executives don't have a lot of time, so you need a, a concise, and cogent message, and you need to get it in and get it out pretty quickly, right? But openly discuss what adversely impacts. That's why it's critical to have an executive sponsorship, a, a high level in the organization who is behind the project, who is not only responsible for the, the project getting done, but is also responsible for helping the team get the resources, decisions, or whatever is needed to ensure that that is the case. Be open to express an unexpected chance to enhance something because people wanna hear what goes well and what, what can happen that impacts them. Learn about what it is that, that they're being judged on. If a city manager is hired and they're being judged on improving the infrastructure, do everything you can to help the department get the resources and contracts in place to help them be a success. Because I tell you, that investment, that capital that you invested in that will, will serve the procurement department well in the long run. When you make other requests, when you ask to uh, become a little bit bigger in the organization or that you want to make stronger contributions. And adversity. You have to build in flexibility and alternatives because there will be adversity. What alternatives are available to ensure the project's success? Are there other projects that are going on that you can consolidate to save money, save time, save mobilization costs? What could be lost if the project is not done? We have to be cognizant of what other sources of completion are available. I always want to understand what projects are active and what suppliers are on property in case something goes wrong and you need assistance for another uh, project or contractor to step in, you know already. And that also means uh, project managers as well. Think about what can escalate the cost. When we talk about total cost of ownership, time and time again, we've got these beautiful things that we couldn't maintain, we couldn't find the parts for later, or it was too expensive, or the biggest hit of all, we forgot to budget for it. And so now we have a crisis because it's down and we have to find some way to get it fixed. One of the things I'm really big, and I always talk to our project managers about when they're designing things and when the engineer companies are designing things. Be careful about function over form. Something may look beautiful, but if you can't maintain it, then what's the point, right? One example of that, which is easier to maintain? Granite, slate, or quartz? Most people are surprised, but these are questions that will make us invaluable to our departments when we ask those questions at meetings so that they would understand, oh yeah, it costs a lot more money to maintain granite, although it appears cheaper, but the total cost of owning it is far more than the actual cheap granite that you got. It's porous, number one. It must be sealed generally every six months. I'm sure many of you have granite in your home. When was the last time you sealed that granite? I guess some people will have some weekend projects this weekend. But the point is, is that slate has a rough surface, which also has a certain maintain, that it must be maintained in a certain way. But quartz is non-porous. 
It is actually ground up granite. So it's very smooth and it's easy to keep in the long run and far cheaper. No extra products, no extra labor cost is associated with that. So always consider the soft cost. The soft cost is the processing of things where you're using people and, and, and machinery and other things. Hard, hard costs is the labor and soft costs is the, the people and other things that it takes to get things done. We're gonna talk about outcomes and objectives, project approach, stakeholder roles, how to create synergies, and to start strong and finish strong. We are still under purpose, and this area must be considered fully holistically. All of the aspects are key to successful projects. The first objective, we need to be clear on what we're doing. We need to be clear on what it is that we're trying to accomplish. Also, we need to see, is there additional outcomes we can do or be able to obtain as a result of this? When you're looking at your project approach, you have to ask, the department generally has one thought, procurement has another thought, and management yet another. That's why there must be clarity in order to determine which project approach works best. And also I'm very big on being able to communicate up and down and across the lines. So when we think about vision, we must be clear and communicate well on that. I know that there's a flow that's worked in the past for me where I meet with departments to try to flush out as many details as I can in advance, even before we start the first solicitation the first draft of the solicitation, so that when you're talking to people, they will tell you additional details and facts that you will find invaluable. How many times have we gotten to the end of a project and learned some things that we could have found out a little bit earlier with just spending a little bit more time and asking maybe a few more questions? Project approach. There are different project approaches. When we're talking about construction delivery methods, we have a construction manager at risk, design, bid, build, design, build, and we also look at the risk factors. One of the things that's very interesting about that is I don't think that we understood in the past how all of these methods work together. As you know, there's increasing attention for design, bid, build, and the reason for the design bid build attention is that the Design Build Institute of America, which is a great organization, they try to help the owners understand the construction process. So if you get a chance, I strongly advise you to attend their courses for owners because it's very helpful to see how to get things done. And at these places are the engineers, the contractors, and the procurement people and other team members outside. You have suppliers and things like that. On the flip side of that, they're also doing a lot of legislation nationally because every entity they go to does things so differently. They're trying to create a more um, standardized approach, whether they're in Florida or in Alabama, which I understand and I can appreciate some of the merits of that. But at the same time, we also should be setting the standard for what we do state to state as well, so that we can bring that to firms uh, to be able to be helpful to them. Construction manager at risk. Now, all of these, uh, let me go back, all of these are based on either the Sparin Doctrine or the Miller Acts or the Brook Acts. We all have these acts in our legislation, regardless of our state in one form or another. So the Spearing Act primarily says that when the owner pays for the design plan, the contractor is only required to build the plans that he has been given. He is not required to value engineer. He's not required to do anything above that. So the designer winds up working for the owner. So we have to be very cognizant of how we in, uh, manage those relationships and encourage our project managers 
to not only have a strong relationship with them, but to have an appropriate relationship uh, with the consultants because they shouldn't trust them so much that they never read the plans. But we should also go over the plans to look for things like brand names or specified vendors and specified processes that are the consultant's preference, not necessarily what's good for us. But the construction manager at risk really constructs at the expertise that he has available, but the, but the plans still belong to the owner. In the um, design build model or the design bid build model is where the owner again is responsible for the plans. They get the plans and then we bid it out and then we build it. A lot of times the issue winds up being is that the consultant gets five years to design something and we get six months to do the solicitation and almost put an increasing amount of pressure on the construction firm to try to get it done immediately. Those are things that I think procurement can take a greater role in. And I know that uh, many of us uh, have firms that, you know, or project and, and, and uh, colleagues that don't always see the same way and that's okay. But I think we can always say, hey, what works best? Each method has a pro and a con to it. So not one method is, is pristine in that regard. Let's talk about equipment and service projects. Those require totally different types of, of methods and, and, and actions. One of the things that I always ask in those two categories, what do we absolutely need? What is required? What would be nice to have? And what is a what is key, what is required that we must have, and what else could we do, you know, while we got the ground open? And third, what is it that we would nice to have, especially when it comes to software? Those are definitely things that you have to put in there because software implementations uh, really are not that complicated because the software is easy. It's just the change management of getting everybody to be on board with it. Managing stakeholders, we're gonna talk a little bit about stakeholders. Why they why they are important and what it is that we want to uh, do in our stakeholder relationships, because we'll find that our stakeholders are the one that helps get things done. We need to understand that we need those stakeholders, and we need to acknowledge the importance of those relationships. We need to determine their role and be sure that we're clear about their impact. We need to have a bunch of communication because that is very key in that regard. And also when it comes to having stakeholders, you have to follow up and follow through. But last but certainly not least, we must manage expectations. Too often procurement team, and you guys know this personally, that we are sort of the last person in line when it comes to being able to assist with projects or to understand how to help with the team. We're generally the last one on the, on the roll for that, but it harms us because we are not taking a proactive role and we have not set what it is that we can and will accomplish together as a team. So it's very, very important team that we make sure that we manage the expectations regardless of what we're doing. If it's a purchase order, if it's a solicitation, whatever, talk to your teams, meet with your departments monthly, uh, be proactive in making sure that they don't just dump on you when they're done. And I know that those relationships must be fostered, but don't be shy and don't think you have too much work where you can't do it. By making the time to do that, you'll be surprised at the improvements in your work and the improvement in being able to uh, help people understand. I have some pat answers that I use for people sometimes, and I think procurement professionals team, we need to have some pat answers. If somebody catches you in the hall and starts running down, hey, we're trying to do this, this, that, and the other, you're like, wow, that sounds like a great project hey, can you set aside some time and maybe let's sit down and go over it together? I want to hear all about it. So you're not stuck making a decision. Some approaches is that 
they come to you and with the facts they give you, you say, with the facts you have given me, here's the decision I'll give you. But understand, I don't, if I do not have all the facts, then this is the decision. Sometimes that, that works out very well. So we can use a number of ways, but we just have to implement a way. Let's talk about how we create synergies. We need to harness the power of us. I am so proud of the efforts of NIGP and some of the local um, cooperatives that are actually getting together, discussing problems, finding solutions. Team, keep that going, keep that going. Because we can be a resource for each other, but also when we have teams, we need to harness the power of us <laughs> in our teams and in our organizations. Seek additional outcomes. Creating synergies mean, what is it that we can accomplish all at one time? Because sometimes there are things that other people, thank you, Kimberly. <laughs> there are things that other people want to do that you know they didn't have the opportunity. But sometimes when we're working on projects, we can create synergies. Oh, you want to be able to uh, update your work order software while we do this project that's going to require multiple years of, of uh, construction. That's great. So let's work together and harness the synergies of that and develop economies of scale. One of the things that I look at, because this has happened before, is that there was one project where you know, they went out and they wanted to do some beautification and they did a median. It was very pretty, um, nice green flowers and wide. It had some pavers on it, it looked great. Well, they didn't look at the capital improvement plan and eight months later, the engineering and the public works department had to tear that same median up because they had to put down some pipes under the ground. So this is where we could create economies of scale. While we're putting the pipe down, we could have went on and did the beautification for the median. That's why we have to take a holistic approach. We cannot just do one thing that's in front of us at a time. And that's how we'll create economies of scales. And trust me, you'll get a lot of street credit when you start bringing this information to meetings to help out. Start strong you're going to have a variety of team members. Some you're gonna love, some you're not gonna love as much. But know this, everyone contributes, everyone has a role, everyone's key. Harness what that person brings to the table. Sometimes you have to just set personality aside, you know, and pray for them in some cases, you know, but you have to set personality aside to be able to accomplish things. You can't just use the people you like because they're easier to get along with. They don't challenge you. They don't help you grow, right? We're here in this webinar because we wanna do A-game stuff. You know, we're always uh, using that metaphor, I think. Bring your A-game. Team, we need to bring our A-game. And I think many of you have, and we need to continue that momentum, but we bring that momentum to other team members as well. We have to stay engaged, keep levels high. When you're doing a project and you have a variety of team members that come in and out of the project during different times, you can keep people engaged without overburdening them with too much information. Finish well. Present your project successes. Do not be shy to say what you have done to help because the people that are sitting in those meetings, when you're saying, hey guys, we need to consider function over form. Remember, hey guys, remember we need to be sure that we add an outreach for our suppliers. Hey team, remember, you know, we need to consider that budgets may be needed, additional funding for the total cost of ownership. That's going to give us the street credit, which gives us a seat at the table. We've gotten all these certifications, we've gotten all these degrees, but we're still sitting in places as clerks. Team, I want better for you. 
And I know you want better for yourself. That's why I've been a proponent of going higher, better, faster, using whatever knowledge we can use, using the power of us, but also sometimes the knowledge comes from the school of hard knocks. My resume looks like a roadmap. I will admit that. But team, what I've learned along the way is invaluable. I've learned how to do construction projects. I've been a part of big implementations for software. I know more about water and wastewater than anyone could ever, ever desire to know. But guess what? It served my organization. It served me well because it kept me growing, moving, and, and, and now we can celebrate successes because we brought something to the table. Recognize all stakeholders. That includes the person that just made a few copies. And the reason for that, because as you are working in teams and growing teams, you'll understand that it becomes more and more important that these teams work together time and time again. Also, you ever notice that all the buildings have a plaque with the engineer, the city manager, and all of that. I say procurement, get your own plaque. Try to get your name on the plaque, really. That's the first thing. But outside of that, try to get your own plaque because you deserve it because you work the hardest. What about resources? When we're talking about resources, who is needed? You know, one of the things that I think is, is clear, and I'm going to go back a little bit and say, one of the things when we're starting strong and we're uh, engaging in projects is that I always say, try to have a project slogan. Go big, go fast is still one of my favorites, but I would say go big, go fast, go team. So who is needed? We need to get the right, not personality, the right skill and the right bus and get that person in the right seat. I don't know, Justin, if this is a time you'd like to take some questions at this moment. Sure, currently we have no questions, but if anybody wants to input those in the Q&A, we can. Okay, I will keep moving then. So who is needed? What is needed? And when are they needed? When we're talking about teams, again, remember I said you have to have an executive that's a high level sponsor and you gotta get the right person. Sometimes you're like, oh, that person doesn't have any procurement experience. But guess what? They're a critical thinker. They can help you with some things. That person is not an engineer. That's all the better because they don't think like an engineer. They can challenge and ask questions that would be extremely helpful in that regard. We have, you know, I always say there are reasons that there are HOV lanes on the highway as well. And there are reasons for the right lane, slow lane. It's because everyone needs to be in the right lane. While I believe input should be gathered from your team, we still need to stay in our lane, so to speak. But procurement for you, in my opinion, you don't really have a lane because you need to understand and know a lot of things that many people don't need to know. But when you're picking the procurement person, make sure you get the right, in this case, attitude because you could have a highly technical person that hasn't said or smiled in 20 years and trust me that is not going to do your project much good and it's not going to do the team much good as well what's needed you need a project plan you need to coordinate with your engineers but you also need a financial plan in your project plan you talk about who's going to do what um, and why and one of the things I realized is that there's a difference between project control and managing insecurities. We need to have a plan that manages a project. I don't think many of us realize this, but most of government business does not take place during business hours. I think many of you know that in one way or another. But this is critical when we learn to do projects in order for them to be successful. One thing I always advise our people to do is part of your project plan is that you need to have an intelligence network. 
I want to explain that an intelligence network is not the same as a gossip network. A gossip network hurts. An intelligent network helps. You need someone that can let you know that, hey, I saw your mayor meeting with so-and-so. Hey, I saw your engineer with the engineering firm over the weekend. That's intel more than gossip because you can use that to be sure that everything stays in the right person because maybe that person will not be on the right bus or the right seat anymore. So gather intel sources and use them properly. That's why the right people are so key. So we know that we'll need some sort of uh, method uh, to be able to pay for things. But one of the things that I didn't put, you notice I used the term financial plan. And the reason why I said financial plan, again, because procurement, we're coming to the table telling them, hey, there is a financial plan that's available or that's needed, not necessarily a budget. How do you pay to maintain that down the years? How do you pay for contingency? How do you uh, be able to maintain it overall? And how do you also be able to enhance it? Because sometimes what we find once we do something, we need to enhance it. You need a method to escalate for decisions. There's gotta be a process by which uh, you have uh, to escalate for decisions. There needs to be an appointed sponsor they need to um, understand that they will have to uh, have, you need a first, actually, you need a first, second, and third, because they need to be available to help you to get the decisions you need. Who takes the 3 a.m. call when a truck plows into your construction site and destroys it? Somebody's got to take that call from the leadership team. So it's very important that we ensure we have a method to escalate decisions if they're design decisions or even procurement decisions or change order decisions. When are people needed? There are three times or several times when people are needed. They're either needed pre-project, during the project implementation, post-project, or closeout. Each of those have specific uh, roles that they're going to have. Pre-projects are your planner, including your internal and external teams. One aspect is that we must be cognizant that the consultants are our partners, not our bosses. And this is something I say to the project managers all the time and engineering, albeit sweetly now, you must say this sweetly, but you must remind them that the consultants are not running the show, we are. And during this group, the group will expand and contract. There'll be a core group, and we'll talk about how to manage those groups a little bit later. For example, on the post project, there'll be the people that obtain the as bills that get the certificate of occupancy or the one that clear liens or punch list or the one that does the acceptance criteria if it's a software project. The last group on closeout does the payment or retainage and then debrief. The debrief is important so that they will know what exactly uh, we did well and what we could improve on and how we can um, work together on our next project in a different manner, but one that's very productive. Create a communication plan. Communication is important. We also need to talk about who our recipients will be, there's specific project data that we will need to share. And then there's social media, and we'll talk about that. One of the reasons why a communication plan is very important is because they uh, are different styles of communication. We use newsletters, press releases, project updates, and in-depth team briefings. So these all require a tailored style. It is not one shoe fit all. Not everybody gets the same email. Not everybody gets the same details. So you need to establish recipients lists. You have your core group, you have your field group, you have your finance group, you have your procurement group, albeit procurement should be on every list, by the way. And you also determine what's the frequency. The frequency for finance may not be as much, maybe once a month when you're looking at project costs or pay applications or whatever. And for the field team, it's probably daily and weekly. And also for uh, 
the executive team, you want to keep them in the loop because you want to also make sure that they're not surprised by something. Construction meetings always occur more frequently because they're with the project manager and they're helping to keep the project on, on task. Social media. I think you must exercise wisdom when it comes to social media. I think that sometimes what meant to be something that's a compliment can turn into something awful because of social media. So I just say use and exercise extreme wisdom. Um, generally the engineering or the public works department will have a website where they show the projects and show pictures, always drive people to that medium. Even if you put out something on social media, just have a link going back to that information so that no one's guessing and filling in the blanks as it were. So we talked about having a plan. We talked about the different styles of communication. We talked about creating a list, schedule groups and individual messages. Let me go back to that. Um, the reason why the individual messages are necessary is because if you're sending the city manager or an executive an update, you cannot have a boatload of details. You need to get to the point and get to the point extremely quickly for them because you'll see that they normally don't have a whole lot of time. They get a lot of emails as it is, so it's best to keep it cogent, keep it short, and keep it concise. Mutually agreed upon plans. There's an action plan. We talk about having some clearly defined roles and talk about provisions and deliverables. Creating an action plan. Clear project timelines. Although there are clear project timelines, you also use the Gantt method of being able to do other things in case you cannot keep to that schedule because there are times when it's difficult to keep to the exact schedule. But you at least say, when do we want to go to commission? When do we want to have a shovel in the ground? When do you want to see the ribbon cutting? And build in some flexibilities because sometimes we're pushed by departments to do things and we're like, there, this is just not enough time. But that goes back to truth to power saying, hey, we can get this done and you will be able to have your ribbon cutting, but we may still have 20% of it to finish after the ribbon cutting. So you gotta find a way to work things out. It does not have to be hard and fast or linear. So we need to think in all directions, not just linear. And have agreed upon deliverables. Procurement, we will have the solicitation available. We will meet. We will attend uh, some of the construction meetings. We will do the pre bid meetings and all of that stuff. That's part of what we normally do. But I also say we need to have more deliverables to stay a part of that so that we could just be there as a resource, as a help, and sometimes just as a sounding board. And again, when you're looking at timelines, it's again, a smart idea to try to develop any economies of scale that you can. Clearly define roles. We must have a clarity of roles, horizontal and vertical. The horizontal roles are pretty much the functional team. The vertical roles are those that um, are the ones where our executives and our, our higher ups, our C-suite people are involved in. We have to have a way to communicate up and down. And we also have to have an understanding of the roles because what I've seen in the past is where uh, we'll go to a meeting and the city manager or the executive in charge will say something. Next thing you know, we're doing a change order and we're doing something that was never asked of us to do. So we always have to clarify, hey, uh, are, is your role in this going to be to advise us on changes that you would like to see done? If so, it's okay. We just be saying, hey, we're here to have executive sponsorship for you to get decisions made and this and that. It's how you frame it. We have to become the experts of framers, just like they would in the constitution. Provisions and resources, enlist coordinators. Again, we always think that they have to have the skill and they need to be able to do that. No, you can just get some willing people that are smart 
So enlist coordinators to help coordinate the paperwork, to help coordinate the financial changes, to help coordinate uh, the newsletter, the information and all of that stuff. And enlist more than one, have a backup as well. There is nothing wrong with that at all. And track available goods and services. We always need to know what's available to us. What do we have in our tool house? If we need something in the middle of the night, where can we get it? If, if a pipe bursts, who can we get it from? If there's something on the construction site that happens because there's a hurricane, do we have everything in place to do that? There must be a clear path. We shouldn't uh, have to ask for something and then have to figure out what the process is to get it. That doesn't help when you're working on a project and it doesn't uh, um, lend itself to being more proactive. So that's certainly something that we have to be uh, considerate of. I do see a question in the chat and I'll take a moment to answer that. It says, should the action plan include performance measures, objectives, goals, and visions? Yes, it should. Yes, it should. That is where you start the momentum. You use that part of the action plan to get things going, to get people going, to let them know where they are and what they're gonna do and why. And that's what you always go back to when you meet with the core team that's getting the project done. That's not for everyone. That's not for your consultant that's on the construction site. It is for your project manager. It is for procurement. It is for finance. It is for city executives. So yes, I would include that. But the performance measures, whose performance measures? If it's what you expect from the contractor and what you expect from the consultant, I always say, make sure you have the ones that you expect from the team. That's why I said, have a clarity of roles and be sure that people understand what their role is. That's a great, great question. Thank you for asking. Deliverables. Construction when it comes to substantial completion. Criteria, disinterested observer. This is where you have someone that is not necessarily tied or related to the project. And sometimes you will use them to be able to run ideas by or to uh, like it's another engineering firm that you say, hey, well, can you take a look at this? We're trying to value engineer this. Is this the right way for us to do it? Because remember the designers will protect their design. And you know yourself that some of those designs have not been great because we've seen on the news what happens. That's why sometimes you need a disinterested observer to help you to just uh, be a sounding board or to be used for when you're doing inspections that go along with the code guy. Sometimes they see things that other people don't see. And proof of operation. For example, when you're putting in like a chiller system, you don't want the contractor to not be there when you flip the switch. He needs to flip the switch and to see as the dust flies everywhere that it doesn't contaminate anything in the process. When it comes to software, that's even more critical because the acceptance criteria means once you say you accept that it's yours entirely. So we have to be very cognizant when using that. Match the outcome to the project plan. What exactly did you have in the project plan? And match your outcomes to that because I've seen us start down a road and the next thing we know, the road that we started down is very different from the road that we ended up on. Again, that's why having clear roles, having performance measures, goals, expectations, and the visions to keep everybody engaged. And that's why keeping engaged people engage is so important. So you keep it in front of them, you keep the slogan in front of them, you keep the, the project in front of them, you keep the goal of what it is that you want to see in the outcome. Do you wanna see a beautiful community center with grass and place for the children to play and splash plats? Although one of my, I guess, pet peeves is that they don't have adult splash pads. Try going out there as an adult, you know, that doesn't go over very well. At any rate, make sure we all are on board with that. Again, acceptance criteria, particularly for software is very tricky, but it has to be operational. And again, you have to match the outcome to this portion. You say the, the system should be able to process requisitions, 
and to be able to award uh, uh, POs inside of it and to be able to email to the supplier, to be able to um, uh, do a receiver report by the departments and to be able to do a three-way match with their invoices. So there are all these things that we need to consider and have inside of that. Functional teams, this is the fun part. The functional team makeup, and I tried to set the foundation already of the type of persons and, and the type of team structure that we're looking at. And so here we're gonna talk about the facilitators, the participators and the non-contributors. A functional team, you need diversity of competencies and diversity of thought. Again, like I said, sometimes there are people we wanna work with because they're easy to work with. And if they can be a part of that, that's fine. But we also need those that are difficult because sometimes the people that are difficult, really they have the right ideas or the right concepts and they challenge us. We don't like to be challenged, but you know that's life. We have to be challenged if we're going to grow, if we're going to learn, if we're going to be able to rise above and be uh, uh, not average. I don't want to be mediocre. You don't want to be mediocre. And we want our teams that surround us to not be mediocre. So make sure the functional team does have a diversity of competencies and a diversity of thought. Facilitators keep the process moving forward and they have a bias towards action. So you need the action people uh, in this role. And it's key to have critical thinkers along with those who are uh, action people because the bias toward action is critical to getting things done. Ascertain the difference between participator or non-contributors. I've been on functional teams where we're like, well, why, why is this guy here? He hasn't really contributed anything. Or he's a part of the team and he didn't necessarily like the project and sort of will not give his best or her best or will not participate fully. We have to deal with that. We have to deal with that and we have to deal with that swiftly because you wanna encourage the contributors to keep contributing. The ones who are participators, the ones who are excited about it and are about getting it done. And sometimes you have a team member that for whatever reason, although their skills are needed, maybe they have a great uh, thought process that would be helpful to us. But if they are not contributing, you, you have to deal with it swiftly. In the words of Barney Fife, and I hope I'm not dating myself, you have to nip it in the bud. Functional team. When we're looking at functional team, this is a great example of what a functional team should look like. These team members are not always a part of every process. They go in and out of the process. We may start with finance initially in order to uh, help us to gather the funds. Uh, engineering will probably always be a part of it. Legal will help us on the contract side of things. And the procurement department is there from start to finish. Also information technology, because sometimes there are uh, information technology pieces of that. And oftentimes they get left out. The building's built. And then uh, IT said, well, we didn't know that you wanted this or that. Always bring them to the table first. If they don't have a, a big, big role, that's fine. Or if they decide to plan the IT and then give it to the construction company to build, that's fine too, but keep them in the loop nonetheless. Any project we do requires these three things. Purpose, processes, and people, whether you're planning the garden, building a house, building a city hall, building a fire station, this is very, very critical because by understanding what the purpose is, a lot of times employees, when they're asked, you know, what does, do you need to be rewarded? How can you feel valued in an organization? They will tell you that they matter. They want to matter. It's more about uh, that. It's about being acknowledged, being a part of the team, being a part of the purpose. 
more than money sometimes. Processes, always think through holistic. I'm big on holistic thinking. Start with the end in mind. And what processes do we need that's critical to getting it done? Remove extraneous stuff that does not add value. That does not add value. People, right people, right bus, right seat, right executive sponsorship. In each of these, purpose must always be quantifiable. You have to have a quantifiable outcome. You need an executive sponsor, strategic goal or a vision overall. You need to brand the purpose, brand the project's purpose. The process has got to be well-defined and easy to understand and follow. If it's complicated, people will check out. But if you make it easy to get it in and out, that's why you have to have your communications that's horizontal and vertical. And you have a process that's clean. You have a communication method and a, and a process and a pathway for people to understand and know how to get things done. Communicate clearly, often, and cogently. And cogently is the key, people. For people, again, diversity, embrace your critics, as we talked about before, and develop a strong team of participators and, and handle the non-contributors swiftly. In closing, guys, we have to be active project participants. We must offer the one thing that executives and department directors need. Hear me and hear me on this, people. Results produce. These are the challenges. You got a new wave of leaders. They really don't have a whole lot of time for dialogue. They want to know what you got done, when you're going to get it done, and how. And sometimes they ask how, but primarily, did you get it done? They want results. In procurement, team, I know you can deliver. You can deliver on that. And resist the temptation to approach every project in the same manner. There is no one style fits all. Deals are completely nuanced. The people are nuanced. The project is nuanced. Remember purpose, processes, and people. I have a few quotes, which I love quotes. And there's one that I normally use that I did not put on here from Stephen Brand. It's, it says that if you, are not a part of the steamroller, you're a part of the road. I want to be the steamroller. I do not want to be part of the road. I thank you so much for attending this session and for taking your time today. And I think we have time to take some additional questions if they're available. Thank you so much for attending my session. Justin? Thanks, Althea. We had a, a question pop in the chat. Should the action plan include performance measures, objectives, goals, vision, et cetera? Yes, yes, they, they should, they should. And the reason why is that that's so your core team would be able to always have an idea uh, of what's going on is something to keep them going, to keep them involved, to keep them motivated and interested in going on. It is so critical that you do that. I really appreciate that question because I think that's completely one of the issues that we have sometimes is that we lose sight of what we're here for and what we're going to do. Great, and I'm not seeing any other questions. If anybody has any questions, um, please place those into chat or you can place oh, those into the q and I, I thought I saw, what is your, it, it's moving kind of fast, but I think I saw one in there that talked about silos. Yes, what is your approach to break down silos? That is an excellent question. And one of the reasons why we have to create functional teams is so that people will realize, I need you, you need me. I mean, it's basically singing the Barney song to them. But one of the primary ways to do that is just start to visit them. That's why I yeah, always baby, it's almost important over. Okay, you to yeah. have uh, meetings with your department. Start, you know, inviting them yeah. to say, hey, I understand you guys are doing a project. Tell me more about it. 
become interested in what they are doing. Because what I found is that to break down silos, we have to talk to each other. We have to remove the assumptions and we just have to reach out. I don't know how many times I have had to be the one to extend the olive branch. And sometimes that uh, I was, you know, not always happy about that. But I realized the value in creating and fostering relationships is hard. It's hard. Try to figure out where the origin of the silo is. For example, if you have engineering that don't communicate very well with public works, try to figure out what the dynamic is. What is the dynamic? Observe people and things and listen and listen because people will tell you, you know, some, somebody told me a long time ago that people will tell you who they are if you just listen. The same thing, when you're trying to break down silos, try to figure out how did that come about in the same place? That's why when we're doing projects, especially when you do a software project, use that as a means to do change management. And the one thing about procurement, if we implement something, it impacts everybody. So even find something small to implement that starts to break down those silos. And there's more I could certainly share on that. My email is there. Uh, uh, so by all means, email me. And I think I have some more strategies I can use to help with that, because that really is a big topic and a hard thing. Thank you very much for that question. And Althea, I saw one more question come in. How do you get end users to buy in to form the group prior to the solicitation? Um, here's what I say to them. My job is to make you successful. And I just want to understand, you know, what you guys want to accomplish. Always give them something that benefits them. Never make it about you. Always make it about them. So I just say, hey, I'm just coming over. I, I know we probably haven't sat down in a while, but here's the flow I like for us to use. One of the things I do by having the monthly department meetings is that we have a list of all of the projects and everything that's going on. And I prioritize them by high, medium, and low. So by doing so, we're meeting and we're uh, 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 discussing the things that are taking place. So then we'll say, hey, let's have meet together. When you guys get your scope of work, let's meet together. And here's how I do it. I have them give me the scope of work, and then I take them to a room. I put the solicitation on a screen using technology, and so they're all looking at it at the same time. Because how often have you uh, uh, solicited something for somebody, and they said, oh, procurement didn't do this or didn't do that. This way, we're all looking at it. One of the ways to do that is to start to meet with them monthly to figure out what they need. Always make it about them. I just wanna know what you need. And then invite them to say, hey, I got the solicitation draft, but you guys are the experts. So could you give me a little bit more input? I put it together and let's go through it together. Cause when you're sitting in that room, they're gonna start talking about stuff. They're gonna let you know the pitfalls. They're gonna let you know the problems they've had in the past. And then you could actually add things that will assist them in getting their uh, project done. And to bring in the concepts we talked about, talk about, oh, did you guys forget to uh, see about what the budget may be in the future years? Remember that? Um, oh, I'm sorry that that light situation didn't go well. But in the future, we can add some language that would help the contractor do this and that. Be creative. I hope that was helpful. And we're starting to get a couple, we're starting to get more questions. And um, Caitlin asks, how do you introduce new ideas, ways of working to people who are very set in their ways? <laughs> yeah, that, that's always a tough one. I think sometimes the biggest thing is to ask is, is what's in it? What's in it for you? Because you'll oftentimes have team members that's been there a long time and are not always willing to change who they are and what they've done. You can't change the person, 
but what you can change is yourself. So sometimes it's how we approach them. And sometimes we simply have to leave them where they are. You know, for example, if somebody is a procurement technician and you've tried to promote them to purchasing agent and they really don't want to do that, leave them where they are. But you, by all means, continue to move along. One of the things that happen is sometimes you have to have external uh, stimulation to get people uh, back on track again. And sometimes you have to go above and say uh, to some of the leaders and say, hey, we, we need to get people re-engaged again. I'd like for you to bring in a consultant to talk about team building and stuff like that. Do what you need to do. And sometimes that's the case. And sometimes that works really well. So you have to think, will this person ever be on board? If you're the leader of that person, then there are some strategies as a leader you can use. And sometimes if you're the leader, they simply have to become alumni. Thanks, Althea. How, not- have you, how have you dealt with PMs embracing change with new successful bidders? One of the uh, mechanisms that we've done for that is that we say to them, we are not married to anyone in terms of that. But what I often do, I'll do a meet and greet. I'll bring the vendor in so that they could talk to each other. And I also advise the vendor about the, um, the nuances of the team. Danny likes football, so-and-so likes this, so that they can find points of connection. So the goal in that meeting is to try to find points of connection. Because sometimes well, what you'll find is that they've always accused, oh, we don't want a new vendor because they, you know, uh, we, we know so-and-so uh, gets it right every time. Actually, the issue with that is so-and-so is doing their job. And oftentimes they cling to people that have sort of taken on additional roles that should be theirs. That's why you see that occurring. One of the things I do, I tell them, hey, let's try out a new team. But I said, because number one, they're hungry and then you can mold them the way that you like. We can mold them to our processes. We can also uh, grow their company to be a competitor because sometimes they have problems with the other ones. So use whatever creativity you can. But I've found that finding points of connection, asking the supplier, you know, who they are and what, what they like and their processes, and then bringing them together with the engineers, because there's nothing wrong with procurement bringing the people together. So I've done that, and I've seen the success of that by finding, I, I, I prep the vendor, I do, because we need new vendors, and I try to help the departments to see that we need to foster these relationships, because in the end, these vendors will get it done for us. And if they're new, you know, they have some ways or methods that you probably didn't think about that would be extremely helpful. Thank you. That was a great question. Thanks, Althea. Allison asks, have you ever had to push back on team members to get them to follow through with their responsibilities to a project when they try to get, when they try to get you to do their portion of information gathering for a solicitation? Of course. I, I think that happens all the time. What I have done and one of the practices that I've done is that I tell the departments because they think that coming up with with specs is hard. And I think that's what I think that's where the person is going with that, that they wind up putting together the specs and all of that for these departments. I tell them how easy it is. I say you ask the five W's and how. One of the things I do do, I have provided samples, provide sample scopes of work to them because the research part of that is that you have more resources in that regard because if you're using any kind of bidding software that has other entities a part of that, you have that. And and that's a part of being valuable, but just give them samples of scope of works and let them figure it out from there. If they do not provide you with what you need, 
you document it well, but that's why having the monthly meetings is important because what happens is that they think we don't care. They, uh, one of the things that we talked about recently is one of the disadvantages of being under finance is that they think that you don't have any idea about their operation, that you don't have any idea about what they do. And so when you take the extra steps, say, hey, here's what I got out of a magazine. Here's also a, a link to uh, uh, Water Today or whatever to help give them ideas and stuff. Assist, but you're right. If they do not provide it, then they don't have a project. But you can at least show that. And sometimes we need to go above their heads. That's You have to do it sweetly and politically correct. And say, hey, uh, go to their leader and not with so-and-so won't help me do something. No. Go there and say, how, how can I be of more help to so-and-so? I'm not sure I know how to engage them uh, in projects. And I want their projects to be successful. Remember, the key is to never make it about you, but make it about them. Thank you. Thanks, Althea. It looks like we have one last question. How do you determine the delivery method? There are a lot of factors that go into the delivery method. For one, and, and I presume it's about construction, or they just said the delivery method, period. So I'll break it down into equipment and services and construction. When it comes to construction, the first thing you need to ascertain has there been a plan already? Do you have a design plan? Because generally, no matter what happens in construction, it always begins with a design plan. So you can say, how fast do you want to get this project done? What are you looking to construct? Ask basic questions like that. And again, even do the five W's and how. From there, you determine, okay, we want to be able to, in 18 months, have this fire station out of the ground. What's the fastest way? Well, you know that if you do a design, bid, build, 18 months is impossible. But what you could say, okay, this project, because of what you're after, would benefit from using design build as our delivery method. We'll have in Florida, and this is not the same for all the others, but in Florida, we have a design criteria package. Now, nothing in the law says how big or how small that package needs to be, but it does have to have some elements of that. Then you take the design package and you select someone to finish the design and someone to construct at the same time. That's how you determine what is the uh, what are what is it you're building? When do you need to have it built? Where do you need to have it built? Because sometimes there are constraints in that regard as well, and and those are some of the things I play I use for that. When it comes to equipment, one of the methods is pretty much an ITB. You need to use an RFP if you don't have a solution, if you want them to also answer some questions or to bring you some solutions and some alternatives to be able to do things. That's when you would use like an RFP. And for construction, for design bid build is when you have plenty of time and the design is not complicated. So each one, you have to figure out what is our environment? Do we have a project team that can manage design build? Because sometimes that's the case. Look at the skills of the people around you. Look at the funding. Look at the, uh, the timeline that you need to get things done. And that's how I generally determine uh, alternative delivery methods, depending on what it is, how fast we need it, and where we need it. Thank you. Thank you, Althea, and thank our audience for the great questions. We had a lot of positive comments uh, come into chat. Uh, please take time to fill out the evaluation survey. Once we end the webinar, you'll receive a prompt to take that. Both the recording and survey links will also be emailed to you later this afternoon. Thanks again, and have a great day. Thanks, Althea. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And please attend the other two sessions in December and January. Thank you, and have a good week.